Welcome to the show today. Today, I have Milko van Rijn on the show, and he's the global head of digital communications at Mettler Toledo. And I'm very excited to have you on the show. I'm not going to do a big uh, bio and intro right now. I'm going to dive right into the story because uh, I want to learn a bit more about like, uh, you know, what shaped you and, uh, and uh, what got us to where we are today. So, Milko, can you talk a little bit about um, maybe one or two of the defining moments that you feel really shaped you as a human being, really shaped you as a leader? Well, that's difficult to say, right? There's so many moments that, that shape your personality. It's, it's hard to pick um, one or two events. Uh, of course, there's personal life and there's business life. Um, every little success in daily work, it gives me a boost and, and it drives my passion for the next day. Uh, in personal life, of course, the, the birth of my, my children, my beautiful twin daughters, was probably the most amazing moment of my life. And, and, and I think it's the little things that shape your personality. It's a lot of people around you. It's your peers, your coaches, your managers, uh, your team, obviously, all the people that you spend a lot of time with um, in private life and in your, in your professional life that, that shape your personality and that make what you are in the end, right? It's, it's a lot of daily fine tuning over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you mentioned specifically people uh, in that context as well. I mean, is there some, you know, uh, a specific example or a situation or moment or maybe specific people that you feel like this is really something that, that shaped me along the way or somebody even that shaped me along the way? Uh, well, um, the ones that shaped me the most are the ones that are the most difficult to work with. And uh, so we're in conflicts. I think I learned the most about myself. Um, and then I'm not going to name any people there, obviously, right? Because I don't want to put them into a bad light. But that's usually in, in times of conflict, you learn the most of, about yourself and how you act and how you behave and react in special pressure situations that make you learn for the next time. Um, obviously, my, my managers along my career have shaped me a lot and they have helped me a lot. I've had some great coaches on the, on the way. And... Uh, and I take a lot of their strengths with me and, and, and try to adapt them into my own life. Obviously, I'm, I'm not copy-pasting, um, but I, I get a lot of help and support throughout my life. Um, hey, yes, and I think that my peers are as important as my managers. And, and I believe I have the, the greatest team, like where probably everybody thinks that, but I definitely have the greatest team in the world. And, uh, and they helped me along the way. I'm, I'm nobody without my, my team and my, my employees and my, my peers that uh, have a, a great intelligence and a great passion as well in the digital marketing space. So they are shaping and helping me and, 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 and supporting our common goals uh, every day. You, know, you mentioned the, the, the topic of passion several times now, so that's where I want to go. Um, yeah. This is a, a very important topic, I think. And uh, I just want to know a little bit more, like, like what makes you so passionate about the work that you do? I mean, why do you get so energized and pumped up about the work that you're doing? Um, well, it, it, has to, it has to do with exploration. It has to do with being, staying curious in your life. And if you stay curious in your life, you learn new things all the time. It's a bit stressful sometimes because you may have to change your mind every day or almost every day. And things that seem to be rock, rock solid today may fall apart the next day. So what you have to stay be is you have to stay open, you have to stay curious. And with that, you, you create something new and then you see how something blooms up and how something develops. And that brings passion to me. I think that's something that I try to pass on to my, to my teams all the time, that it's all about the passion. Uh, it's also at the core of my, of my hiring strategy, um, especially when I, when I, when I hire uh, specialists in digital marketing. And um, I think the least share of my team has started in digital marketing, but they're all passionate and skilled people. And they have talent. And I think that if you have the passion, you can train technical skills. But if you have technical skills, you cannot train passion or you cannot train talent. So that's the most important hiring factor is that you have to feel something like a fire inside these candidates 
that that makes you think well i can take that person alone and he will will he will drive his own thing because he feels accountable passion brings accountability and accountability brings dedication in your daily work now this is a great one passion as a hiring strategy i like this one a lot <laughs> absolutely <laughs> This is a good, I like that hiring strategy a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned accountability, um, you know, and, and, and several aspects, but what would you say, like, you know, as a passion is a very fluffy term, you know, it's, it's, you know, everybody understands a little bit, you know, one, one person says, oh, golf is my passion. Another says blockchain is my passion. Now we're talking yeah. about completely different things, right? Why do you think it's so important to be passionate or engaged i guess is another word for that why, why do you be, believe it that's 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 important like to be passionate at work engaged at work because i think i think passion is something a, a characteristic is you cannot be passionate about just one thing you're either a passionate person or you're not and may that then be applied to golf or you to digital marketing or or in my case, digital marketing, or my family, or when I do some experimental agriculture project in my, in my land, then, then it's, it's the passion. It's about the fire that somebody has or not has. And, and I think you can then apply it to anything. And, and, and that is the, the, the core piece of a character that you can then motivate to put your passion somewhere where you can then give him also the empowerment to drive something by his own and then build up something, grow something, and then harvest something by himself. So passion has to come along with empowerment and empowerment then comes along, uh, then drives the accountability for, for what your people can then do and then deliver. Um, you have to give them the credit, but you also have to give them as much freedom as they need uh, to, to take time and to you know, build up things. I don't like, I don't like those uh, strategies where you run from quarter to quarter and, uh, and, and you have to deliver short-term results. Yes, of course, we're all working for uh, um, companies that are the stock exchange. We have to deliver our quarterly results, but it must be a thread. There must be a core passion, a core project, a, a common vision that you can strive for, for, for a long time. Because only that will, will allow you to incubate things that are yet unsure if they're ever going to bring, bring a harvest or not. Right? And those incubator projects are probably the ones that really motivate, right? where you go to new grounds, where you, have, where you try something that never ever somebody did before. That's like feeling like a real explorer going to the North Pole for the first time. This is how we feel sometimes. I love this and, comparison, yeah, to the to the explorer especially, and uh, you know about this idea that passion is something more underlying than just about golf or just about blocking, yeah. you know, just it's more about like it's 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 something deeper inside that you know drives you hu as a human being to get up in the morning no matter what, and then apply that basically to anything you want, literally. So this is a very interesting yeah. viewpoint. And uh, you mentioned the unknown, you know, you mentioned the pursuit of, you know, something that you're not sure yet that, you know, it's going to work. Maybe it's not going to work. Well, this is also a common thing these days, right? I mean, I'll, I don't know any other way uh, you would do innovation than this, right? I mean, that's pretty much um, uh, the way to go. And with these, uh, you know, pursuits and uh, journeys, there's usually interesting stories that uh, come along as well with some interesting lessons learned uh, along the way. Is there anything like really important along your journey um, that you've learned, like a really important lesson? And um, like, what is that? And sort of like what context around it and, and how did you learn it? Is there something that you can share us, uh, with us there? Well, when we talk about the unknown and then the lessons learned is the, probably one of the most important learnings that I've done is that whatever you learn, you have to build up on that learning, but don't trust that this learning will stay the same or this fact will stay the same forever. You have to stay open for change and you have to stay open to reconsider your previous position and stay flexible. Um, that's what I think makes a good leader. I think that you can trust in your experience, but you can also trust that your experience may not always be the one and only solution uh, for a new problem. A new problem might need a new solution and it might need that you shift your view and perspective and take new factors into account. And if you stay flexible as a leader, if you don't say, hey, I've done this for 20 years, so I know how to do it, 
um, in digital marketing, that's probably not going to work out. Right? We have new customer benefits. We have new ways of communication, digital transformation happening everywhere. So we as a leader, we need to stay focused, but also don't believe that we know everything already uh, because we're somewhere at the bleeding edge of technology and things change. And that's what's maybe so fun about my job and my sector is that you probably have a new job every year because you're talking about whole new things, new technologies. We, we've talked about user experience. We've talked about customer journey management, marketing analytics. We're going into voice communication now. Um, so these are fundamental changes in communication that, that, um, that you have to stay flexible on, which gives us another problem really, or another challenge. That is the, the whole change management pro process. Um, we might be flexible. We might on top of all the new developments, but we always have to consider that we have to take our organization along with us. And not everybody in an organization may be as, as, as from thinking as you are, or as, a, as, a, as flexible as you can be. So we have to make these changes, uh, slice them in bits and pieces, and, and make sure that we have a personal benefit for everybody, that we can take the organization with us along. Um, there is no reason why I should go with a big vision in digital communication if the organization, the people that actually communicate, interact with their customers, they don't, they don't accept or they don't see their benefit or it's not helpful for them, um, this will fail. Um, so we have to be sure that with all the visionary stuff that we're, that we're working on, we have to break it down into bits and pieces that bring personal benefit for both us and for Bo and for the, for the customer. Otherwise, we're not going to generate more profit or revenue for the company. Now, this is a, a, a very interesting topic on change management, uh, change management as well. And um, especially also in terms of like the, the, the actual, you know, work that you're doing. I mean, this is so, I mean, it's the combination of communication and digital, obviously, right? Um, uh, what, what, what is in that combination that excites you so much? Because you have this incredible passion, you know, I mean, the way you talk, you're just so engaged around this topic as well. What is it about this combination or about digital communication in general that, gets you so much it's it's that you know if, if you look at the thousands of years of communication that we've been doing right I mean, there's a, a big journey how communication happened between people um, thousands of years ago people had the challenge that they could not preserve what they say so they started chanting and singing making songs out of their stories so they could be remembered Later on, they started to uh, carve letters into stones and they started to write on paper. Then we started to print books. Then we had uh, telephones. We had communication going through wires and now we're going digital. Um, right now, we're again, I think, at, a, at an edge or at a change where we're trying to lose that interface of typed characters. Um, we've been using characters, typing, or written language for many, many thousands of years. And now all of a sudden we have the technological capabilities to overcome that, that interface. Uh, we, we're running into voice, uh, voice technologies that allow us to have a conversation with the computer. Remember that we, we talk about Siri, uh, Google, and, and, and Alexa. Um, when you look at the latest, the latest technology, uh, advance, advances that, that you can just have a conversation with an intelligent machine that understands what you really want to do, what is your intent, right? And, and I think our generation, or maybe the younger people, uh, they, are, they are leveraging all those new capabilities. When I look at my kids, um, they look at me very strangely when I go to my mobile phone and type in something in Google search box. And they look at me and say, Dad, what are you doing? Just ask Siri. You know, she will tell. <clears throat> and that generation change is amazing. And, and it's, this all happens in the field of digital communication. And we can leverage that to interact in a more human way with our, with our customers. And, and to, to give them a benefit, to give them more efficiency and effectiveness. Because they all have a need. They need information. They want to have a conversation, interaction and uh, we can help them to get to their point quicker and in a more convenient way. 
So convenience, technology, uh, technology generations that, that come quicker after each other, that is totally amazing, I think. And we're in the middle of it. So look at, look at how we do this, this uh, video conference, right? This, this would have not been possible 20, 20, 30 years ago. And now we just do it like it would, we would have done it every, like forever. I love what you just said there. It's, it's just uh, something that stuck with me, which is uh, communicating with our customers in a more human way. Yeah. You know, this is, uh, if I probably would have to put it in one tagline, that, that's what I heard. Um, yeah. That's really powerful, you know. And this it is sounds what, a bit contradictory though, right? right? Because we it? use technology to become more human in our communication. <laughs> oh, interesting viewpoint. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, very true. Very true. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we're getting we're getting closer to how humans used to communicate with uh, without technology, right? They spoke to each other and they had direct conversations, one to one conversation, which is when we now look back at our mass emailings that we did ten years ago, or our print mailings where we never knew if that was really read. This is totally contradictional to how humans interact, really. You want to see a face, you want to see a reaction. There is not just the, the text you say or the speech, but there is nonverbal communication that we have now in this video conference, but that you would never have in an email campaign or in a print campaign or in an ad text. So um, technology helps to become more human using technology. This is a very interesting point. I just want to finish this off before you move to the next one, because what you said, I think, is so essential because we went through a transition or to a period in, I don't know if it's the last you know, century or, or less or something like that, but um, where communication became less and less human because it was less and less in our natural style. I mean, even typing on my phone is not natural for me, you know, Absolutely. even swiping over my phone is not really natural for me, you know, um, you know, opening an app, like it's not like, it's not really that natural. Right. Um, yeah. And we, we, we tend to go back to our complete natural human style. Thanks to technology, you know, very, very interesting. Now I want to move a little bit more into the topic of, of leadership because um, you are, you know, in, in charge of a fairly large organization and, uh, you know, in, in change situations, there's always, uh, there's always more to do than do there's just two operations. <laughs> so uh, there's lots of challenges. There's lots of, you know, stakeholder expectations and balancing acts and sometimes politics and all these kinds of fun things. So my question there is like, how do you manage all of that and still stay sane? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think, Hey, um, coming back to your home where your family is, where your children are, I think that brings you, brings you back. And, and, and somehow, again, this is, we're coming back to a more human work, work experience as well. Um, I think private life and business life also comes a bit closer together lately. Uh, we now do more home office. We, the, the, the border between private and business life is not so strict anymore. It's not like 100 years ago, you go to the factory, you work eight hours, and you go out of the factory and you go back to your home. Now, it's all somewhere, it's your life, right? And, and that's why I, I really dislike the term uh, work-life work balance, because it's just one life. There is no work and life, because your work is your life as well. So, and um, also there, I think it, it's all coming together into a more natural way um, in, in staying sane in that case as well because you don't have to live two lives right it's just one life if you do and uh, my kids bring me back to reality very quickly when i get home or when they come home uh, so that's the the, the the surest way to, to stay sane um and on the other side there may be conflicts there may be politics uh in a company but but whenever you are in in times of where you feel uh, in discomfort, just remember we all have one common goal and we all, we all strive for the same and that, that's having an, a good time and that's having a, a good life and a good, and a good goal for the company, right? We're all working for a company, so we should not fight against each other. Um, so in any case, when there's a conflict, usually there's a very rational or very personal reason to it. So people might feel 
uh, uncomfortable. So the best way to solve that problem is to make that person feel more comfortable and listen and learn. I think that's the that's the best way of of get of solving conflict is to listen to what they have to say. Uh, and usually they're not that far as it might seem in the beginning. It's a very important topic and I think also a very interesting lesson, you know, um, you know, because sometimes we're, we're, we're brainstorming and thinking and analyzing how can we solve a problem? How can we resolve conflict? We completely forget the listening part. And, uh, you know, listening can be so simple that we sometimes overlook it. You know, we jump to the next step, right? And very often, and maybe this is your experience as well, very often, if you just simply listen, many things just you know, suddenly disappear. Oh, there's, oh, I just didn't understand what you meant. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> very interesting topic of listening. <laughs> and, and it's something you can learn, right? Because um, leaders tend to think that they know how things have to be done. So they, they're used to speak. Uh, but they may not be as much used to, li to listen and to learn. So this is, I think, uh, something that every leader, every manager has to really train is to keep their, eye, their ears open and just listen to what people have to say. And that will bring always a better result than if you just go with your own opinion. Uh, we once did a, a, team building, a team building exercise together where we all had to do a twist, right? And then we, uh, we all had to answer like 10, 12 questions, everybody individually. And we all did that, and then we came together, and then we had to do the same quiz again and negotiate within the group that we are with two, three, four, or five people more, and then come up with a group result. Now, um, all the managers, including me, right, we all thought, well, I have the perfect answer for my ind individual um, solution. And then we started negotiating, and we're all not 100% happy with all the compromises. But guess what, which, which result was the best? It's always the group result. It was always, in every single case, the group result was better than any of the individual ones. And I think that's an important learning. That was one of my key moments as a, as a manager to, to really get myself back you know, on, on, on my seat and say, okay, well, reconsider sometimes and listen. That's an important lesson learned there as well. Very, very, very nice one. So the last question I, I want to ask is a little bit more in, up in the clouds. Um, and um, so let's imagine you're a wizard and you got a magic wand and uh, you got a wish. So <laughs> if you had that wish, um, what would you wish for if, uh, if you could wish for anything in the world um, that would at least multiply your impact 10 times? It could be on your work, on your industry or on the world in general. <laughs> you, got, you got the wrong partner for that interview for that, for that question. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, such a big believer in magic because I believe that we all have a, in our own power. I'm more a person that believes in smaller steps because if I strive for something that improves myself by factor 10, uh, that will keep me busy for a few years, right? Um, I think that I need to have an improvement every day and, it's, and I'd rather have the small steps. And the small steps, if I can improve every day just a little bit, that makes me go for the next day and that keeps up my passion and I'd rather have very small steps but a million of them that will eventually get me to a better performance or to a better life or us to a better world rather than being a wizard and changing the world at once. Maybe that's a learning from, from doing some IT projects. That's usually not such a good approach if you want to change the world at once. That usually fails to my experience. I love so, what you said in the beginning there, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned basically um, that you believe everybody has it in their own hands. This, I mean, this yeah. by itself, I think, is, a, is an interesting topic. So I'm, I'm going to put it a little bit into this relation of, of, of the wish and why I would say, you know, what if, what if many more people had that awareness? You know, know that many, it's actually in their hands. I would, I would wish that everybody has it uh, has that awareness. I think that would be the best thing. That would be the start of everything. Um, then I would wish that everybody gets that awareness because if they trust in that power, they will start to build up the passion to make small changes and they will continue to build their own path and to go their way. And I think many do, right? But everybody does it in their own way. 
and uh, and some people feel more comfortable in that way and some people feel more comfortable in that way but if people have the awareness that they can make change they will do change and they will start working on that change every day i think that what might if i had a wish as a magician and uh, my wish would be that they all find out that they can make a change so i love that we still arrive there <laughs> i don't yeah. wish um because it, it's very interesting everybody has a different perspective on that and uh you know, I, I mean, it, literally, it was just in the first sentence there, right? Um, what you said about, you know, yeah. uh, the, the awareness that, you know, we have it all in our own hands. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a very, I mean, this by itself is very powerful. So thank you so much, Milk. I really appreciate you being in the show. Uh, we're going to link below this video to some resources like the company page, your LinkedIn profile, so people can, you know, follow you, understand a bit more what you're up to, connect with you as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here, Milko. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.